Welcome to Camp Nuggle International Center for the Fine Arts. It's the Conference on Migration and Media Awareness 2021. A dialogue of media practitioners, policymakers, non-governmental organizations, activists, and newcomers. This event is organized by RRN, FSK, and Camp Nuggle. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say how glad I am for the invitation I've received from the organizers of this very important colloquium on the critical subject of migration, particularly at this time when the world is still reeling out of the ravages of COVID-19. In our unguarded moments, we talk about the post-COVID era, but in real terms, it may very well be true that COVID is with us to stay and that we must, in the nature of things, learn to live with it. That being the case, the subject that you have invited me to talk about is that of migration. Migration, as many of you who are in attendance will appreciate, has different permutations. Many of you will remember that there have been numerous factors that have occasioned migration. Over the years, we have had weather being such a factor, we have had conflict being a factor, we have had economic circumstances being a factor, so that when one is talking about migration, one must look at the causes of migration. But I am acutely aware that the organizers of this conference want the participants to focus on migration in the present circumstances. Of course, it is not the case that we'll have occasion to go into the nitty-gritty of each of the critical factors that create or cause migration. But in the context of Africa, which I will spend a considerable uh, length of time for the time of the time allotted to me talking about, it is important to appreciate her circumstances. Many of you will remember uh, that the continent of Africa as presently constituted is a product of uh, the European powers which sat in Berlin in 1884 and 1885 and partitioned the continent of Africa arbitrarily, creating states which later became the post-colonial states that we are aware of. The arbitrary acts of the European powers, and it's important that these countries are named so that they have the mark of Cain upon their forehead as we deal with this subject of migration. There were Germany, Italy, France, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, the Belgians, and I believe that the Danes could have been there as were the Portuguese. When these countries assembled in Berlin, they did so not out of altruism, but it was out of self-interest. They discovered that the best way to exploit the resources of Africa, both human and natural, was to create spheres of influence so that they could do their things and give effect to their diabolical activities without the necessity of conflict. And this brings me to the point that I had left hanging, the point of the arbitrariness of the petition. When they were creating these nations, they were possibly aware that there were a multiplicity of nations within the continent of Africa. 
but they simply drew lines and these lines became their protectorates and as I said a little earlier became colonial states and it is these colonial states which through force of arms later regained their independence as independent African countries so that the post-colonial African state is a state that was created in circumstances that we do not want to spend a lot of time talking about, but circumstances that were informed by selfish interests of alien powers. The economies of most, this, most of these states, even as we speak now, are still reeling from the impact of colonization. You will remember that the first African country to regain her independence was Ghana in the, on the 6th day of March 1957. And the leader of Ghana at that time, Kwame Nkrumah, was very clear when he was talking to his compatriots. He said, seek ye first the political kingdom and the rest will come. The rest meant that economic prosperity would come with the necessary accompaniments that the quality of people's lives would improve, that there would be employment opportunities, that they said that we would deal with the issue of ignorance, that is, that meant that we would have facilities, education facilities, which would allow young men and women to go into the education institutions and acquire knowledge that would then empower them to participate in the economy. They talked about poverty. All these were economic issues which were promised after the countries had regained their independence. But we also know that the colonial power did not leave out of uh, out of their own volition. They were in many cases forced out. And many of them were forced out in circumstances where they did not want to leave. A perfect example is France. We will remember what France did in Guinea Conakry. They destroyed whatever needed to be destroyed so that the new government could not function. We remember what they did in Algeria, and we will remember what they did by signing pacts with their former colonies, and they created an environment where they would continue to manipulate the economies of those countries through currency manipulation. And that is still the case in many of these countries today. The Portuguese, were pushed out forcibly and they destroyed the little that they had built and if they did not destroy it they undermined it. We also know in quite a number of countries uh, which were colonized by the British the circumstances were no different. They forced the governments which had taken over, the African governments which had taken over to compensate individuals who had literally stolen land from the peoples of Africa. The Belgians will also remember what they did to what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, including creating an environment where conflict has remained a permanent feature of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Italians did the same wherever they were. The apartheid regime in South Africa did the same, and in many ways, apartheid regime still is alive from an economic perspective. We have seen the circumstances in Zimbabwe where sanctions have been imposed on Zimbabwe because they refused uh, to compensate the white farmers. All this history is necessary as a basis for understanding the migration that is now taking place in many African countries. The idea, if you permit me, of the colonizer was that post-colonization they were going to create a neo-colonial state which would remain dependent 
on the, the former colonizers and of course subsequently when the former colonizers themselves lost their political power they became beholden to the new emergent powers such as the United States of America and the Soviet Union before its collapse. So, if that is the historical basis, if you permit me, or the necessary political environment that we are talking about, what is the relationship between that and migration? This is the relationship. Many African countries find themselves and they started finding themselves in this situation immediately they regained their independence in circumstances where the promises of independence cannot be fulfilled because the economic environment in which they operate is not controlled domestically so that young men and women go to universities young men and women go to high schools and they discover to their chagrin that they cannot get opportunities to satisfy their immediate needs. And what do they then do? They then recognize that the only way it, to gain economic salvation is to run away from their countries. And they hear anecdotally or otherwise that the place to gain this salvation is outside of the continent. So that your typical African migrant who is running away from conflict in Niger or from Burkina Faso or from Mauritania or from the Cameroons does not believe that his or her economic circumstances are going to be solved when they move to Nigeria or they move to Ghana. They have been told by their cousins and others who have been exposed that the place to go is Europe. And this is why you see Africans moving away, moving in droves from these conflict-ridden countries for Europe. And they go to Libya, pass through Niger or Burkina Faso and find themselves in the Mediterranean Sea braving the harsh weather to find themselves in Italy and then they cross over to France or they cross over to the United Kingdom to engage in menial jobs as a way of survival and as a way of sending money to their kith and kin in their aboriginal homes. So in many ways, you find that the pattern is also very interesting. If an individual was or is from a country that was colonized by the French, they are from Algeria, they are from Morocco, they are from Niger, they are from Cote d'Ivoire, they are from Senegal, or any of those colonies which were controlled by the French, their desire to migrate is to migrate to France. First of all, because it is the language that they are going to be comfortable with the language. And because, courtesy of the neo-colonial project, they believe that France is the land of milk and honey. The same argument goes with those who may be migrating from Cabo Verde or Guinea-Bissau or Mozambique, or Angola, which were colonized by the Portuguese. They want to migrate, and they want to migrate to Portugal. They want to go to Lisboa, or Lisbon, or Porto. And at the very best, if they don't follow that route, they would want to be in Sao Paulo, or Rio de Janeiro, in Brazil, which in many ways is a sister country uh, to, uh, to, to Portugal. And the same with those who are migrating from former British colonies such as uh, the Gambia or Zimbabwe. Their migration is to England, 
the, you'll find them in Manchester, you'll find them in Birmingham, and if they don't go in that direction, then they go to the cousins, and I'm using the word cousin simply as a term of art to define their close association between the United Kingdom and the United States. You'd want to go to the United States, or go to Canada, or go to Australia, once again because of the language. And if you go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, they want to go to Belgium. You find them in Brussels or Leiden or Ghent or some other country. And if you find people in countries such as uh, uh, Somalia, they want to travel to, to Italy. And, uh, and for some reason, they also would want to go to Finland or Sweden. So in a nutshell, I'm saying that migration is brought about by a combination of factors, but is, it can be said that the economic circumstances of individual in many ways dictates their desire to move out of their aboriginal homes. And in addition to that, conflict has also contributed, because in a number of these African countries that I've mentioned, because of poor domestic politics, the net effect is that people cannot till their land, people cannot engage in economic activities, and therefore the conflict situation and the economic circumstances conjoined then create a perfect ground for migration. The Somali have a say that everybody wants to be in their home unless their home is the mouth of a shark. And many Africans find themselves migrating. And I had the occasion to listen to one of the migrants who had been rescued when they were crossing the Mediterranean Sea and they drowned near Lampedusa. And she said that even if she were taken back to her Aboriginal home, at the risk of death, she would still want to attempt to go back to Europe. You know, that is not a natural instinct. The natural instinct, as I've alluded to before, is that everybody wants to be in their home unless their home is the mouth of a shark. And it would appear to me that in Africa, the political, political economy, uh, political, economic and social circumstances that prevail are of such a nature that the aboriginal countries of many migrants is like a shark's mouth and therefore they do not want to stay in those countries. Which then begs the question, how you do you resolve this issue? But before we talk about resolving the issue, I want also to talk about experiences in other parts of the world to demonstrate that migration is not simply and purely an African problem. You and me know that it is a major problem in the Americas. As I speak to you today, we see the wave of human activity, of the waves of migration from Haiti. The Haitians going into Panama, being joined by people from Central African American countries, from Nicaragua, from El Salvador, from Colombia, from Mexico, and there journey is towards the United States of America, which in their minds is some kind of Shangri-La or El Dorado, the land of gold. And if you listen to the interviews in which they are engaged, what they are saying, I'm going to the United States of America because I believe that upon arriving in the United States of America, I'll be economically and gainfully engaged and I'll be able to participate in economic activities which will give me income, which will income I'll use to improve the circumstances of my immediate family and also to send some money to my kith and kin in my Aboriginal home to the extent that I can and because 
their circumstances have not improved and will not improve unless we support them. So you see, migration is alive and well in the United States of America, in that region, in North America, and in Latin America. And in Asia, we also see that trend of migration. Right now, after the collapse of the Afghani, the Western world-supported Afghan regime, and the coming into being of uh, countries uh, of, of, of the Taliban, we see the migration of people from Afghanistan into Pakistan. And in Europe, we also see the migration of people who are crossing over uh, into Europe from Turkey, from 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 uh, uh, Turkey, from Belarus, going into Lithuania, going into Poland, going into Hungary, into Hungary, and we also see there is also migration in that part of the world. And in many cases, it's either because of political circumstances, economic circumstances, and sometimes it is because of environmental circumstances. So even Europe has this kind of migration within Europe, by Europeans moving into Europe. And we have seen in the Middle East, we also see people moving in droves from countries such as Yemen. We have seen people moving from Iraq, from Syria, and, and, and we have seen people move from Lebanon within that Levant region. And if you go into Asia, you also see people moving, migrating into the much more prosperous, uh, prosperous countries, people moving from Laos and Cambodia into Vietnam. We see people migrating from Indonesia, the Rohingya, being moved out of the aboriginal, what they consider to be the aboriginal home, and going into Bangladesh. So this phenomena is one that is global in nature. And because it is global in nature, when I choose to talk about Africa, and this brings me to the limb that I had abandoned, is for us to appreciate that it is something that deserves global attention. I've chosen to focus on Africa because this is my land, this is my Africa, this is my continent, and I think that there is a sense in which measures can be taken within the continent of Africa to address the problem of migration. And as I draw to the conclusion of my intervention in, on this particular subject, I want to pose the question, is it possible to solve the problem of migration? Do the circumstances that now exist lend themselves to quick solution to the problem of migration? Permit me now to give you the circumstances of Africa which demonstrate to me that migration either of an economic nature or forced movement of persons is going to continue to be a problem in the continent of Africa in the foreseeable future unless steps are taken to address the issue and serious steps at that. Look at Africa now and look at the number of conflicts that are taking place. In Cabo Delgado, in Mozambique, we know that there have been conflicts and that there, there has been displacement of persons with the consequence that people have moved out of their homes. And when there is conflict of such a nature, it means that people don't participate in agriculture. And if they don't participate in agriculture, if it is their source of income, it means that they will then have economic problems and their desire will be to leave their countries altogether. We see the same kind of problem in Ethiopia with the Tigray problem with almost 4.5 million people being displaced. You will see that there will be a desire to move out of Ethiopia completely by in the intervening period, of course, they are in refugee camps in South Sudan or in Sudan or in certain cases, even in Eritrea and in other parts of Africa. But the consequence is that we are building an army of individuals whose desire will be to leave the continent of Africa and to go elsewhere. And look at Sudan. They have just, I think there has been an, a coup d'etat in, in, uh, in, in, in Sudan. And if indeed that is the case, you'll find the people in South Sudan will also want to move. We know the circumstances in, in, in South Sudan. We know the problem that is in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We know the problems that are in Burkina Faso, in the entire Sahelian region, in Mali, in Guinea, and in the Cameroons. And 
all these are pointing to one direction that we, we, are, we are going to have millions of people who will seek to move outside of the continent of Africa because they believe that the, their circumstances will improve if they are outside of the continent of Africa, which calls into question how do we resolve this problem? And I think that the African politician has let Africa down in a major way, almost across the continent. Of course, there are few exceptions, but the exceptions are few and far between. When you listen to your typical African politician and your typical African bureaucrat, it would appear that migration of their population is insignificant. I've seen on occasion the European Union holding urgent meetings to deal with the question of the migration and the death of Africans in the Mediterranean Sea and in other parts of the continent of Europe but I have never seen the African Union call an emergency meeting to deal with this issue. I have not heard ECOWAS calling a meeting to deal with this issue. I have not seen the East African community calling a meeting to deal with this issue. I have not heard SADAC calling a meeting to deal with this issue. Which means that the question of migration is not a priority for African governments, it is not a priority for, 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 for many of these bureaucrats and is in the back burner. And I'm now saying that necessary pressure must be brought to bear on African governments to create circumstances which make it unnecessary for Africans to move out of their countries, which means that conflicts must be resolved. How do you resolve conflicts? The African Union makes the claim under Africa Agenda 2063 that it is the desire of all Africans as articulated by their political leaders that Africa will be prosperous and a powerful player in world economic affairs and politics by the year 2063. But there is nothing that they are doing about it. Instead, they are chasing little things. The Igbo in Nigeria have a say that is only a fool or a madman who chases after a rat when his house is on fire. Africa is that metaphorical house. It is on fire. But our leaders are chasing little rats while they should be focusing on extinguishing the fire at home. Conflicts must be resolved. Number two, corruption must be addressed. Many African countries are suffering because those who are entrusted with leadership are engaged in activities which undermine their economies. And when the economies are undermined, then it means that opportunities for employment and opportunities for other economic activities are undermined. The net effect is that people become desperate and when they become desperate, then they think that their solution, the solution to their problems lie elsewhere. Number three, Western countries, the former colonial powers are also playing a part. They still continue to engage with African countries as if they were appendages. And the world economic arrangement is still skewed against Africa. And lately we have a journey come lately into the affairs of Africa, China, which is engaging African countries and lending them monies which they have no capability of paying in the near future. And therefore, I'm suggesting that Africa must, in the nature of things, begin to unite her activities. And we are not being naive when we talk about the, naive, the unity of Africa. We are simply recognizing that African countries as presently constituted 
do not stand a chance against China, do not stand a chance against the United States of America, do not stand a chance against Europe because they are too weak, too divided and therefore susceptible to manipulation. And therefore, going forward, it is only proper that they continue, to, they move towards working as a united front. And within the continent, Africa must also move in the direction of doing away with visa requirements. It's, it's, it's a tragedy of gigantic proportion that if a Liberian wants to visit Kenya, they need a visa. That if a Kenyan wants to visit South Africa, they need a visa. And we must deal with these issues so that there is free movement of Africans within the continent of Africa and therefore even eliminate work permits. Once we do that, I believe that African economies will grow. And if they grow and create opportunities, then the appetite for Africans to leave the continent will also reduce in that order. But as I said at the very outset, Migration is not a unique African problem, it is a global problem, but I've chosen to focus on the African continent because it is my continent and it is my desire to see that our sons and daughters fulfill and realize their ambitions within the continent and that if they want to travel to Europe or America, they do so under circumstances that are dignified. As it is now, many African countries, who African individuals who find themselves on the migration path are humiliated. You've seen them humiliated in Rome. You've seen them humiliated in Paris. You've seen them humiliated in London. You've seen them humiliated in the United States of America. And if you are an African and you wanted a visa in any one of these, to any one of these European countries, then you've got to answer numerous questions. As a friend of mine once said, you even have to count the teeth of your grandmother as a condition precedent to obtaining a visa to travel to any of these European countries. Africans are being humiliated because the circumstances at home are not suitable. To the African leaders, I tell you, if we do not do this, then sometimes I fear and I hope that my fear does not become a reality. That one day, again, in ways more subtle than before, we'll find ourselves enslaved or colonized. Because our kith and kin who go into those distant lands, many of them live in subhuman conditions and they engage in menial jobs and they are humiliated. It is our duty to change the circumstances. We have lamented long enough. The time is now to solve the problem. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you'll have a colloquium whose deliberations will give birth to solutions, which solutions will be embraced by governments and institutions in order to change our world for the better. Thank you and God bless you.